What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Jack Ramsey's Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Morang. Flying solo today. Brandon's out taking care of the family and uh, not trying to do eight podcasts in a row. So giving him a little bit of a break. But we have a ton of questions to get to. Yes, your Neil Olshay questions will answer as well as I can. Uh, we have a, a minor update, at least today, from Chris Haynes that we'll get into. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about the team and all the other questions that were that were answered. So, again, first of all, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you. The community is rapidly growing. We just crossed another major uh, landmark for the podcast downloads, so I I can't begin to thank you guys enough. Um, it, it's it's truly special and beyond anything that I ever expected, so thank you. Um, with that being said, I'd like to continue growing it. If you can, please go and head over to the uh, Jack Ramsey's podcast and subscribe on your favorite platform, Spotify, Apple Music, whatever it is. Uh, And if you consume the podcast on YouTube, head over there and subscribe if you haven't already. Please help us out. We're trying to get to 2,000. We're just short of 1,800 right now, uh, trying to get to 2,000 by the time we hit Thanksgiving, which looks like it's going to happen, which, again, congrats to you guys, and uh, thank you all so very much. Without further ado, let's kind of get into it. I don't want to do Neil stuff right out of the gate. I really don't, because it's going to be a bummer, bummer, bummer right away. Uh, so I'm just going to tackle some of these as they came in, uh, the early, excuse me, the, the later ones that are on top. So from Brad Street Racing, at Bob Brad Street. So the end of the day, you said there's no way they can sign Ant, plus bring back Nurk and Roko. That tells me they almost have to make two moves if they do indeed move CJ to clear room for Simons. And if they move CJ, they're already bringing back a big contract to multiple players. So <laughs> even when I try to dodge Neil questions uh, to start, I'm going to kind of dodge or take on a Neil question. Um, if there is a change in personnel, or excuse me, a change in, uh, I guess, change in personnel at the top and the executive positions, uh, who and when guys could be moved changes. Um, that's not what we're talking about right here, but we're talking about CJ being moved. I, when you look at how things set up, if the illustrious Ben Simmons trade happened, uh, I would imagine that probably Covington and Nurkic would also be cleared in the deck on, in that regard too. Um, not in the same deal. I'm I'm not saying CJ Nurk Covington for Ben Simmons. I'm I'm saying in, in multiple deals. That's kind of what I think he's hinting at here is that or not hinting at. He says straight up. I think there needs to be at least two moves. I do too. Um, the way that you stagger this is you make the move necessary. You kind of know where you are cap wise going into the off season, and then you field offers. You you've you've got Anthony Simons uh, who will be a restricted free agent if you keep him through the trade deadline. Um, and you've got bird rights to go over. So that allows you to kind of figure that out. And that's where I think you're going to go. If you're Jody Allen and you keep saying that we're going to commit, this is where this is real money, we're going to do this, then this is like put up or shut up time, right? This is where uh, the luxury tax stuff starts to go out the window. Like if you're going to do it, here's here's what it looks like. Here's your top, another top 20 NBA player, uh, a potential defensive player of the year kind of guy. Um, let's say they make another move and they get Miles Turner. Um, I think that's kind of like the, the type of fit that you're going for of a, a floor spacing five who has uh, rim protection and rim protection and, and defensive switching ability, good mobility, that kind of thing. So you're basically sending CJ Nurk uh, Rocco out and you're bringing in Simmons and uh, Turner. You're probably sending out some picks in that, in that, in that kind of swap as well. But, 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 but uh, Turner's deal, I think, is 17. Ben's is, at, what, 34, I think, next year. Um, and Simon's deal, listen, uh, it would not surprise me in the least bit that if he keeps this up, which I'm <laughs> shocking to everybody else, I think he's capable of this and more, it would not surprise me in the least bit to see him in that 18 to $22 million range. But, and here's the big but, he's still going to be uh, $15 million less a year than CJ. So when it comes to luxury tax stuff, it does give you some wiggle room to figure some things out. So essentially you're sending out CJ at 35, Rocco and Nurk at 24 combined. You're sending out almost 60 million and you're bringing in 45, which gets you close as far as um, what you want to figure out with Anthony Simons. And then you kind of figure it out from there. No longer do you have $112 million tied up in your three guards. Now you've got $115 million. Tied up between Dame, Norman, Ben. That's a little bit more feasible, right? So I think that's the way it's got to end up going uh, if, you know, the, the dominoes start to fall. 
Uh, and this will kind of be our, our, our lead in here. Um, we'll get to the Olshay stuff. This is also from uh, Brad Street Racing. So if Olshay gets fired, is anyone likely to take over that as the ability to make a move at or before the trade deadline? So here's the thing, and I want to make sure I get this get this right word for word um, from uh, Chris Haynes, who released the following um, earlier that – the, the initial report, obviously, is that there's alleging a toxic and hostile work environment where staff members have been subjected to intimidation and profanity-laced tirades, among other bullying tactics. Uh, what we did find earlier was that um, there was a another note or release from Haynes where uh, Omavelmi and Myers, the firm, the firm enlisted invest, investigate the claims, extended its investigation to interviewing individuals outside of personnel at the practice facility and including for, cur, <laughs> former and current employees. Uh, Haynes said sources told him the investigation, which was expected to wrap up shortly, could last a few weeks before a ruling on Olshay's future is determined. So if you caught the pre or the post game show uh, for the Lakers game, I kind of went over how this timeline's probably going to look. Um, even then, before this kind of went public, it was shaping up to be something that was kind of like probably going to go a few weeks, with the exception of if things didn't look good for Neil himself, he would have to just basically resign, and that would put an end to this earlier. But most people in those positions of power, not just in sports, just in the world, they they typically don't do that. They, they got there by, you know, crawling over most people <laughs> to get to those spots. And that, that's, that's it's a kind of a crappy thing to say, but typically when you see this situation, that's kind of how they get there. So, but um, who could slide in? Uh, you've got three potential people in Portland right now who would look as interims, and that's Rosenberry Branch and Cronin, um, who have all been with the organization for quite some time. Um, they all serve in various capacities. They're never front facing. If the Blazers wanted to go out and get somebody, there's two people out there that have had loose ties to Portland in Danny Ainge and Dennis Lindsay. Uh, Danny Ainge is obviously not employed right now as far as uh, full-time GM or assistant GM. Uh, I've heard that he's doing some, uh, kind of, consulting work on the side um and Dennis Lindsay last I heard is just cashing checks from the Utah Jazz still so uh there's some names out there but I don't think we're far enough in the process yet where um those kind of things would get a ton of traction uh but I would believe that the Blazers from a business standpoint would want to get somebody in now because it's not going to do them or I should say now when the investigation concludes if the findings are negative and Neil O'Shea is dismissed that's a big caveat. I, I don't want to make, skip over that. If they were going to get into that, I would imagine that they would want somebody in place. We're now, what, three weeks before Thanksgiving? I would assume at the absolute latest, if Neil was dismissed, they would want somebody in by Christmas. As far as a full-time interim, going to finish out the season kind of kind of guy. Otherwise, they're going to go with somebody on, on hand, on staff, and I would imagine it would be one of the three between uh, Rosie, Branch, and, and Cronin. I think from what I've been able to gather, I think it would be Cronin, but um, everything's there is pretty much guesswork at this point. So, um, on a lighter note, uh, <laughs> this from at the Nason, I would ask whose terrible food take is worse, Danny's waffles or Brandon's scalp potatoes? We all know it's Danny's because waffles are awesome. It's a take so bad, even Neil would agree with Danny. Wow, that's that's that's. That's rude. I I say that all as a setup here for his actual question, which is time to put on the tin foil for this question. Any chance they end up firing Neil, but also let him have any kind of say in the process to hire a successor? <laughs> Hell no. Hell, no. if they get Neil up out of there, nope, 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 no. They are going to scorch if he is basically removed. In today's world, they are going to exercise his name from everything. Everything. If he, if there's just, there's no, 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 there's no way. I say that, but <laughs> there's just no freaking way. Um, Ian Fowler at Ian Fowler42. We all love, hate the trade machine. Listen, not all of us love, hate it. I love it. Uh, I I love the RPG element of like how do I build something better? Uh, I know it sounds gross when we're talking about human beings, but I just like to build things. It's what I do. Um, 
But yes, are there any vets out there who could help the Blazers on bloated expiring contracts like CJ could be traded for? Or what are realistic pieces, parts that could help this near, next year's bloatation and Ant's expected contract? Too early to say outside of the kind of prescribed Ben Simmons stuff, right? Um, one of the ones I was partial to the last two years is like Harrison Barnes in parts, and that's looking to be pretty good. Um, it's still, it's a short list, realistically. It's a short list. Um, but as far as like, I, I wouldn't do it for any expiring because Portland doesn't do anything with cap space, and their functional cap space wouldn't be that much because they're a team that's operating effectively over the cap. Does that make sense? Probably not, but we'll circle back to it as we get closer and closer to the trade deadline, and I'll dive into that. Uh, another one here from the, from the Nason. I love the big guy, but the Blazers decided to move on from Nurk this year with the best, most realistic trade targets for a Nurk trade. Two names, Mo Bamba, Miles Turner. Those are the two names. Uh, I, I've been kind of beating the drum on both those guys for a while now. Bamba's price, price of the brick may have gone up a little bit on him. Um, he's been performing very well, knocking down threes, getting blocks. Not great rebounding, but... Um, doing the things that I expected him to do when he came in the league four years later. So, um, but yeah, I think those are probably the two because you got to get a starting big back in return. It's either that or it's going to be like a, I don't want to say Rashawn Holmes types because that's the kind of a knock and Rashawn's probably better than Nurk at this point. Um, that's debatable, but yeah, it's, you need a starting caliber big. And as much as I love Cody, Cody's not a true starting caliber big that you can roll out for. 75 games. <laughs> most most bigs you can't roll out for like 60, and Cody's in that boat. So that's kind of how it goes. Uh, another one here from Ian Fowler. A lot, a lot of double-up questions that, this week, and there's a ton of questions. So uh, I'm just going to kind of bang through as many as I can. Why isn't Nas playing more? I keep hiring. We need a big point of attack wing. Um, don't we have one? Uh, you and uh, fans of Nasir Little, I'll put it that way, are, are definitely beating that drum. I'm going through and doing my aunt work for something that I'm working on right now that I'll hopefully have it out in the next couple of days. I have not had an opportunity to go do that yet with Nas. From what I have seen, I believe right now Chauncey is feeling a little bit of pressure because they've started off slowly in the record. Regardless of what the organization has said, I don't think that they're okay with what happened on that road trip going 0-3. The Dame stuff as far as like lingering over the season and whether or not he says he's committed, I, I don't doubt that. But I'm just talking about if things get a little too weird, you're just asking for more pressure on the organization. And I believe part of that led to, hey, you know what? We suck defensively. It's going to take even more time to continue being remotely good defensively. What we can do is we've got this 22-year-old kid who is apparently the one of the best shooters in the entire NBA. We should probably get him on the floor some more because offense is more valuable than defense consistently over the regular season. They're one and three in the games that they've run the four guard lineup out uh, for any extended period of time. So mm, trade off, I don't know. But I would imagine that pendulum starts to swing back it's in Nas's favor if either Norm or C or CJ Norm or uh, Anthony Simons cool off. Two, of, both those guys are two of the best shooters in the NBA right now. They're both 50, uh, 50 40, 90 guys. So uh, and they're doing it on pretty damn good volume. So I, I think it's less to do with Nas right now and more to do with. Team uh, sucking defensively and offense still kind of disjointed. So, um, Rob Willie says, uh, is at the real R dub and we'll see the games. Thanks, Root Sports. So, with that, I preface this with Dame Slump, have you noticed increased energy in the defensive end? Yes and no. Uh, it's been there in spurts, but it's been there in spurts in his career before. Uh, last year was was definitely a uh, his probably worst defensive year outside of his rookie year. Not probably, it is. It was. It was not good. Um, but yeah, I, I think I've seen him be better about screens. He's still he's still really bad on screen angles. I just don't think it's ever going to change. He's had some moments where he's completely disappeared, but he also has had some moments where he's a bit more uh, he's a bit stronger at the point of attack. Even if he gets beat, he gets beat two, three dribbles later. Like that's better. So, yeah, I'll, I'll give increased energy on the defensive end. But the flip side is I want to see that when it looks like where he's, his offensive usage, usage is going to settle in. Like, where does that balancing point kind of find? So, it's it's weird. Uh, Brody, at Brody, a lot of numbers. Uh, I wonder if Brandon's love it from last night when he was talking about Neil Oshie being gone. Uh, was planned or spur of the moment? Too funny, especially Danny's reaction. Uh, we had just spent 20 minutes talking about that. And I was like, you know what, man? This is a real bummer, and we don't have a ton of information. And I want to pivot away from this. I'm like, let's, let's talk about this game, which is going to suck. <laughs> It, it it was not a good basketball game. It was a win, and beating the Lakers is always fun, but I was like, ugh. 
And Brandon completely caught me off guard with his love it saying Neil's gone. And so, yeah, that was completely spur of the moment. Just so you guys know, we, we BS for about five, 10 minutes, um, before we go live on a couple things, um, for the pre and post stuff, I, 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 but most more often than not, I want to catch his natural reaction. I don't want to give him uh, a big rundown or a heads up. Like I want to like get that natural reaction. I think that's, that's a little bit more fun. Um, Joe and I used to do that with outsiders. Like we had but plenty of prep time and talked about a million things, but um, we took that uh, outline that our producers gave us. Sorry, guys, we love you. Uh, and we destroyed it usually. Well, I should say, shouldn't say we. I destroyed it usually five minutes into the show. So um, I I just like it like that. So ninety um, percent of the things you're gonna see, hell more than ninety, like ninety eight percent of the things you see, they're like uh brandon knew tinfoil time was coming but he didn't know i had the tinfoil snap back and i was going to go on that giant rant uh alongside it so it's it's mostly just keeping it fresh it's more fun uh cdm 81 at cdm 81 88 11 excuse me if neil's put administrative leave then who would be in charge of basketball decisions while he's gone like i said it's going to probably be one of those three guys uh cronin uh rosie or branch so uh nobody anybody on the general blazers public is going to be familiar with that's kind of you'll you'll get to know them if this decision happens. Uh, Eric Salmella at Eric Salmella. Who do you guys predict will have the dunk of the year for the Blazers? Listen, I know everybody's thinking Danny's going to say Anthony, and it came to mind. But um, Greg Brown, East Bay Funk, dunked in a damn game, y'all. Uh, safe money, safe money in game is on Greg. Dunk contest. Mm. Ant is a champion. Just saying. In game, Greg Brown. Greg Brown's going to have, he's going to get loose on somebody and somebody's going to die. It's, it's going to be absolutely bonkers. Uh, Josh Bullock at Jeb Aspie. If Dame is dealing with a nagging injury, should Billups have, have, have him sit a couple of games? And if so, do you think Billups would also if Olshie is fired? How much pressure that place on Billups to finish well this year? Oh, there's a lot to unpack in that last one. Dame looks significantly better. And we talked about in the post game, uh, against the Lakers. I still think that there's a lingering thing, and even Dame has said that the ab is bothering him now. So I'm always going to err on the side of caution with athletes. I don't. I, that's why I probably I'm, I'm not, mostly because my, my legs are, are dust at this point, and so I just kind of go, eh, maybe it's a good idea to sit down. You know? <laughs> but um, I would sit him for a couple games. But the flip side of all of this is, on the other part of this question, if Olshay is fired, how much pressure that placed on Billups to finish well this year? I actually think it takes some pressure off because you will have finally relieved or removed the last remnant of the previous administration. And with that, any preconceived notions of it not being the roster. Yeah. So... Um, I think you would have somebody else who comes in who, and most people around the league I've talked to have all believed that while well, Damon CJ are fun and yes, good. They have a absolute no BS ceiling. Um, somebody new coming in probably strips that away and goes, we're going to take a look and do something differently. And I think that would actually alleviate some pressure on Chauncey. Uh, Adrian Bernersich at a Bernersich. Even if the investigation is inconclusive, the Blazers clearly need to remove Olshay thoughts. Uh, rampant speculation is, is everywhere right now. And I will if say if I was going to run a straw poll right now, I'd say it's probably 75% believe that he's gone for what it's worth. Um, the, the flip side to this is, is if he does return, what, what, I mean, he's got to kind of look at himself like basketball Jesus at that point in time. And I don't know if that's a tenable position for the Blazers to be in. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out because the investigation came out of nowhere. This isn't like something that was building up a ton like it was the Sarver stuff. So um, I just got to wait for the results and, and see what, how, you know, what comes out of it. It's, it is what it is. Um, Adam Antium at Adam underscore Antium with the way the players are currently playing the season. What are the current price points looking like on the RFAs? Like if you're talking about Ant, I would say anywhere between 18 and 22. Like Gary got what? 15, 15. Was it 17? I can't even remember now. It was 472, right? It was the, the, the crab deal. So, um, Ant shot creation and shot making ability. 
um, and off the off the dribble um, shot creation like spikes his price point. Um, that's the most valuable thing in the NBA right now. So I would imagine that he ends up right around there uh, if he continues to be um, this guy or more. So there's there, there's a way he bumps it up to like 22 to 25. Like if all of a sudden, I mean, let's say a, a change happens and CJ's moved earlier in the deadline and, and all of a sudden it's a kind of a three-guard lineup with more forward heavy, so it's just Dame, Norm, and Ant, and Ant is playing closer to 30 a night as opposed to 22 a night, and he's putting up 18, 19 a game to the point where you're like, if we gave him a full 34-minute, 35-minute workload, he's a 22 a game scorer, right? Hmm. And his agent's going to know that. Um, uh, Bill Duffy is not a fool. So uh, they they want to clear a path to more playing time for him. That kind of leads me to the next question. Tyler Cornwall, at Tyler Cornwall, 31. Ant is only averaging 20 minutes a game and has been very efficient. Should we look to move a guard to the deadline to open up minute, minutes for Ant, who seems like the future? I mean, I'm going to land on yes. That should surprise zero people who've ever heard me talk about Ant. But at the same time, they, they've got to figure something out of the guard position. It's just they have no forwards. I mean, that's not a shot at Nas. It's just like as far as like guys that they can consistently trust to produce on both ends or overwhelmingly so on one end to justify being on the floor, then, yeah, they need to figure something out because their four best players right now are guards. Not good. Not a great problem to have. So, um, not... Not thrilled um, about that kind of going forward. Um, Teddy Beresford, at Teddy Beresford, in your opinion, what is the biggest contributor to the increased turnover numbers? One, increased physicality. They are absolutely, absolutely allowing guys to get hit more, uh, particularly the closer you get to the rim. Uh, Casey Holall and I have talked about this a ton. Uh, Ant has been murdered a few times and uh, gotten absolutely no calls, and I kind of complained, and then I watched Dame get absolutely drilled and went, Maybe it's not so bad for Ant. <laughs> so uh, I think that is a big part of this. Uh, I think the new ball is also contributing. Uh, I also believe that uh, this team, specifically the Blazer team, is struggling with it, um, not because of a new system, but because guys are just in weird places right now. The vibes are bad. And they're not so comfortable. Like three years ago, like guys just knew where each other were going to be. It's just... Everybody's on the same wavelength. That's not the case right now. So uh, take it that what you will. I don't think it's necessarily like this evil, awful, terrible thing. It's just like, it's just not good vibes in that starting unit. And then the second unit, like they just don't have a ton of creation and dribble drive ability. Uh, Nance is good. Ant is good. But neither of those guys are great. Uh, and a lot of those guys are working in new with each other. So um, for the most part, I, I think it's, the increased physicality and the bad vibes. I think I would I put those one and two. But the increased physicality is, is I'll be honest, I like it in the game. I like that guys can be a little bit a little bit more aggressive at the point of attack, that they can be a little bit stronger at the rim um, without having to worry about picking up a foul or, you know, getting baited into the foul merchant stuff that Dane was doing a little bit, but Trey and Harden and others were, were really emphasizing. Um, so I think that's 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 a good thing to see. Uh, Dustin Wilshire at Dustin Wilshire. What's your biggest concern with the upcoming schedule? It's on the road. <laughs> That's the, my biggest concern. They're zero and four on the road. Uh, I think quick put a tweet out earlier today that only Houston and Detroit are the only other winless teams on the road. Conveniently enough, the Blazers will play the Houston Rockets on this road trip. They will also play. Was it the Clippers, the Suns and somebody else nuggets? Yeah, it's not an easy road trip. That's for sure. Um, two and two is a good road trip there. Then again, Going 500 on the road is always the goal in any given season. Anytime you get above that, you're doing great. But the Blazers started off 0-3 with a couple gimmies in there. Um, so how they are able to put this thing together on the road, I think that's a big, big deal. Can they put it together on the road? Um, the intensity has been not great on the road. That's the first thing I'm looking for. Then the execution. Again, I'm gonna, this is going to be my, my, my theme this year. Process, process, process. The results will come after that. They have enough talent. But if the process sucks, it's just that the talent's not so overwhelming. Like the Heatles, Miami, Golden State, like those dynastic teams, the, the Spurs, their process was great, but their their talent was so overwhelming that when the nights when they had crappy process, it was like, man, well, 
The Nets, when they've got, you know, or last year when they have Kyrie Harden and KD healthy at the same time with, you know, Harris and a couple other guys plugging some holes, um, that's just one of those situations. So um, we'll kind of wrap this one up. Connor Strong at Connor Strong 14. Ideally, but realistically, what's the move at the trade deadline? It's Simmons. It will always be Simmons. Barring a Jimmy Butler-esque, Paul George-esque, like, I'm out of here trade demand. That's the move. It will remain the move um, for the immediate future. So that's kind of where we're sitting on that. Um, overall, I, I think the big takeaway from this team right now is we still don't know what the identity of this Blazers team is. Uh, there's even more concern about the identity in the future of the franchise as far as uh, this current iteration as this cloud, I guess, overhangs over Neil O'Shea and the, and the team while the investigation progresses, uh, what that means for the non-basketball personnel uh, on those relationships and how those vibes affect all those guys around them. Uh, I think Dane did a great job of kind of rallying the troops the other night in the first game, uh, but it's going to be kind of a flag, just kind of or a, you know, a, a fog, not a flag, uh, that hangs over the franchise until it's decided one way or another, which to be honest, kind of feels like that's how it was with Damian Lillard this summer. So I think we're getting kind of used to that crappy feeling, which is kind of a bummer. I think that's also impacting, again, the overall vibes of the franchise right now. So, hey, maybe getting out on the road and getting away from stuff is good for them right now. Uh, maybe they can find a little bit of themselves. They can find their mojo. They can find their good vibes, their good feelings, uh, and get a couple wins. Uh, I, I think that would do a lot for the basketball soul, a uh, little chicken soup for the soul kind of a deal here, but it's uh, basketball wins for the soul uh, just to kind of cleanse yourself a little bit. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Like I said, I was going to go wrap it and answer as many as I could. Uh, we will be here for Tuesday for the pre- and post-game show. Brandon Sprague and I will be back for that. So uh, look for those, and then we'll also have be a little bit earlier when we get outside of the uh, Pacific time zone. Uh, I'll put the times out there as those come available. They'll be anywhere between 3.30 and 4.30, I think. Uh, again, if you haven't already, please like, rate, review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast from. If you're feeling spicy, give us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Um, we always want to know. And uh, if you're so inclined, subscribe to us on YouTube. We really, really, really appreciate it. In all seriousness, no. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you all so, so very much. Uh, Lamar Heard shouted us out the other day. And uh, so many of you reached out to say, hey, I heard you on the show. Uh, or I heard the podcast on the, on the, the Blazers broadcast. And thank you. Um, thank you to Lamar. Uh, again, he didn't have to do it, and he did because he's awesome. But uh, it's it's very, very, very cool, and it's very humbling to have your guys' support. And I couldn't do any of this stuff without you, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. I mean that truly. Uh, and we will have you covered uh, all the rest of the way for the rest of the season. So like, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, if you ever do have any questions, jackedramsies at gmail.com, at jackedramsies on Twitter, at Nanny Morang, at Brandon Sprague. Uh, and until the pregame show, we'll have you covered then. Take care and talk soon. Bye. <laughs>